right, guys, thanks. We've got lunch for you, but I told a couple of students who said their preference at least for now is to take their lunch at the end of the event. So we've got um, a nice lunch and beverages for you to take on your way out. And thank you for being here. With that, I'll turn it over to Professor Christopher Yu. Thank you very much, and thank you all for coming. Um, for our most recent career speaker series lunch with alumnus, uh, recent graduate Pratik Agarwal. Before we get into uh, introducing Pratik and getting today's uh, event going, I wanted to go oh, make sure everyone knows we're recording the, today's event for the benefit of the people, your colleagues who couldn't make it. So I wanted to make sure all of you were fine with that and would understand if you felt otherwise, but we are, um, if you stay, we are taping the event. Uh, just to point out a couple other things uh, that CTIC is supporting in case you want to know and you'd like to attend. Uh, tomorrow we are support, um, doing, supporting, co-sponsoring a conference on health law and anti-racism, reckoning and response at the Perry World House starting at 12.30. I am not condoning you missing classes to go do this, but um, it does go for the whole afternoon and if you would like to come and if that's in your interest, I encourage you to participate on Friday. There's a, a, a noon presentation. It is noon, isn't it? On yeah, the, the invitation will go out imminently. Yeah. Uh, it just came out. Yeah. On the democratic regulation of artificial intelligence, co-sponsored by us, PIPG, and the Internet Technol and Technology uh, Something Coalition, ITSC. Um, sorry. Social Society. ITSC. Internet and Society Coalition. It's a new student organization in the technology space. Internet Tech and Society, and society. Collaborative. 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 That's, uh, that's, uh, that's great. A, yeah, new one. Yeah. Anyway, uh, democratic re regulation of AI featuring a professor named Aziz Huck from the University of Chicago Law School who's written uh, a, a really provocative article looking at the democratic implications of AI, not just the business and a lot of stuff on criminal law and other things. Um, on, the fall, on April 25th, uh, we are co-sponsoring a 430 program on antitrust and digital platforms. We are entertaining as a visiting scholar, a professor from Germany called, whose name is Heike Schweitzer. Heike co-authored the, uh, the European well, Director General for Competition, their primary regulators, uh, article on how to regulate digital markets and is uh, one of the Europe's finest experts. And she and Professor Huffenkamp will be having that program. And it will be hybrid yeah, in case anyone you want to know. I'll be there too. Moderating uh, or doing something. Uh, dictating, I don't moderate, right? So, you know. <laughs> Uh, but anyway, and that'll it's, we open not only here but also beyond in case people want to participate. All right, uh, and as you know, we're all very busy, and this is coming at such a great time of year when students are just relaxed and taking it easy. But you know, um, if you want to take advantage of this, I encourage, we all encourage you to do so. All right, uh, again, uh, but more to the point, uh, we're really here to, need, uh, to, get, to get to know Pratik. Uh, Pratik uh, is a 2018 law grad who. We had the privilege of getting to know uh, well at CTIC because we did a lot of work together and you helped us out with a number of projects. Currently a fourth year associate at Covington and Burling where you do both antitrust and patent litigation. Um, he uh, generally or patent? Uh, mostly patent. Okay. Uh, graduated with a, a mechanical, engineering, mechanical engineering degree from Maryland. Uh, worked as a software implementation analyst at Accenture. Uh, came back, went to law school, and graduated from here in 2018, where you did receive a, the certificate in business economics and public policy from Wharton, and uh, clerked for, worked as an associate before clerking for John Phipps McCullough on the Western District of Tennessee. Um, we were just chatting about this before. Until recently, the federal judiciary has what's called a pilot program for patent judges, where there's a certain number of judges around the country who take who were singled out for taking patent cases. And uh, that is, uh, he's a judge McCall is a fine judge, but it is the reason you sought that judge out particularly, um, and because of your interest in technology law, and you've returned to Covington. Um, we are delighted to have you here. Uh, and you remember, it was not that long ago, you had that perspective trying to figure out, what is this, how do I do a career, what is this tech law stuff, and uh, how do I make that happen? How did you get from there to here? Tell us about your journey. Yeah, um, so I guess for a bit of background, uh, like Professor you mentioned, I studied mechanical engineering, and I know coming out of undergrad, uh, I kind of had like even less of an idea um, than after law school. Um, I'm sure if you like, if you watch the news sometimes and you see like you're like you see those like big engineering goofs of like 
something happened on a bridge and no one was paying attention, like I probably would have been that kind of engineer. So I was like pretty set on not <laughs> doing that. Um, so I, I kind of worked in consulting for a couple of years and got work experience and then decided to apply to school. Coming into like law school, especially around 1L, like basically it was like the assumption was just like patent, 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 because I didn't really know anything else. Um, but then as I got here and like kind of got beyond your like 1L classes especially, I like developed more of an interest, especially being at Penn with like kind of interaction of like law and business and technology and that's sort of the, the wheelhouse I like really found like an academic um, and personal interest in. And that went far beyond just patent law. Um, so I got involved with like CTIC here, which helped me a lot kind of expand that horizon. Um, and then like tried to take classes uh, that match that often, I don't know what like would be offered now, but things just like IP and corporate lawyering or like things that aren't necessarily like what you think of as traditional legal classes, but more uh, discussing or, or talking about that interaction. Um, and I also found a lot of value in doing uh, not the management certificate, but the other one at Wharton. <laughs> um, I won't bash the management one, but the other one I think I found a lot of value in because I got to take classes with MBA students and actually like interact with with people that are in the business and often technology world and not just and get get out of the law school bubble. And I think it, it shapes a lot of how you might look at the same issues, but from uh, real world and economic perspective. Um, that was kind of like what I focused on. I tried to take every opportunity that Penn offered to get outside the classroom, which I think is what helped me the most. So three all year, I was going to DC a couple days a week to extern at the ITC. Um, so I got to work on some advisory opinions um, and uh, uh, sorry, uh, and like get a get a view from from the trade perspective there. Um, during my 3L year, and I also did the uh, entrepreneurship clinic. Uh, so I think all of those opportunities like put together sort of helped me shape, get, get a better idea of, of what uh, sort of experience uh, I was looking for. Um, and then once I actually started at a law firm, that shifted even more just because I started in the like general litigation and patent litigation group and actually being on a patent matter, um, one of the patent matters I was on actually had a concurring uh, a concurrent uh, antitrust case and I helped out with a few issues on that and then I found the antitrust stuff to be uh, way more interesting which is funny because I never took a class with Professor Yu including any antitrust class because I thought I had no interest in that in law school it just goes to show like there's not really an end of if you're intellectually curious so like when the learning stops it's just kind of like you can always pivot as you learn more things about yourself and learn more about you know, the legal world so I found the antitrust stuff, which now in hindsight seems so you know, clear cut if you're looking for law, technology, and business and how they interact. Um, but I, I really like all the econ. There's a lot of like math and spreadsheets, which I personally like, and then like a lot of a lot of the how that interacts with, with law. Um, so that's kind of where I ended up. Uh, how, how I'm at now. So it's fascinating because um, one. You can always, in every patent matter, plead a, a defense called patent misuse. And what you find, discover is if you can prove the other side in violated the antitrust laws, the patent holder, you can always win a patent misuse claim. So but you almost always, you've, it's not uncommon to see, even in patent litigation, a patent misuse counterclaim or defense raising based on an antitrust claim. And if you're going to do that, you may as well throw the antitrust counterclaim in to boot, particularly because you can get treble damages. Do you see that in your practice when you're in the, the litigation you were dealing with at the court? I'd say, uh, I'm trying to think. Uh, you're saying during quick trip? Yeah. Uh, actually, we didn't really see that. Really? Yeah. Um, it used to be almost automatic. You yeah. would always bring the counter, I mean, the counterclaim as part of a patent misuse defense. Yeah, we actually often didn't even see that pledge. And we saw, um, I guess, one of the cool things about clerking, especially in Tennessee, was we saw like a very wide range of, of technologies and stuff. But, kind of did more 10 million and under damages cases, and I think maybe there were less uh, antitrust concerns based on that, so I'm not sure. Okay. So the other thing is, you know, patent matters can be really large, document-intensive cases. I mean, have you, 
be curious to see your experience in the practice, you know, between patent and trust, you know, what you see the difference are, what you like about them, what it, and what it really means. Okay, there's the stuff you learn in the classroom. I worked one summer for the antitrust division and discovered that the practice of it is quite different from what you learn and see in the classroom. I'd love to hear you reflect on how that's different. Yeah, uh, for both patents. Yeah, please. Yeah. Um, I'd say for patent, a lot of the classes you end up focusing, and this might be a general law thing, but you end up focusing a lot on appellate, right? Um, on how the Fed Circuit ruled on something and then how you might shape law or, or something on instructions or something else, but then in practice it ends up being you're really focusing on, as you've probably heard by now, like kind of telling the story. So uh, one of the cases I'm in was on agricultural equipment, you're like sort of telling the story like of how this device was invented and how it helped farmers. And I first, within the first three months on a case, I went and <laughs> got to visit like three different farms in like Pennsylvania and around this region, like driving farm to farm, and you're just like talking to farmers and like asking what this equipment does, and like that's not stuff you ever are told that you'll be kind of doing, right, in school, and as like first month fresh like associate hadn't even known if I passed the bar yet. And you're like, all right, well, you're gonna accompany this partner and go like see if, like what this technology looks like in person. So a lot of it is a lot more like investigative almost, like you're, you're trying to learn the best facts that you have to be able to tell, and this is as a plaintiff, obviously, but like to tell your story, and then obviously the opposite side of that would be, if you're a defendant, you're maybe going to those same farmers that have purchased this product and saying, actually, like it doesn't work that well, or actually, I have this competing thing and that works just as well that uses a different technology. Uh, so I think a big, a big part of it, especially as a younger associate, is you're really learning like the facts on the ground, so to speak, of, of what your case is and tell that story because you're, you're going to be the one that's like closest to all of that compared to more senior attorneys, especially as a first and second year associate. And that does entail like a lot of, like even when you're having paralegal or staff attorney help, like a lot of substantive doc review, which really means like, you know, you might be looking at invention. So one of the big things in this past case was like an inventor's notebook, which I thought was really cool because you're seeing like contemporaneous drawings of what someone did 15 years ago when they were first thinking of this product and now it's like that drawing is on a patent and that's sometimes your, that was your best evidence of when this was first conceived. Um, so a lot of that stuff is, is definitely like I think the biggest difference um, between like learning something for a district court or a administrative judge proceeding versus uh, I think you sometimes are, are a little far from the practical day-to-day -day stuff when you're in law school and that's, that's what I found really interesting. What about the antitrust practice? So, not having taken an antitrust class, <laughs> I would say um, one thing that's interesting with antitrust is we see a lot of these, like, the big headlines of, like, who's going after who, but then you don't see what that day-to-day -day interaction is like, and it's a lot more, I'd say it's a lot less combative than it might seem if you were to just go by headlines, because a lot of the times, especially with regulators, you don't basically don't want to be, you're not trying to be overly combative until you really have to be, and until a certain point, you are pretty much cooperating to provide FTC or DOJ the stuff they want, because it helps you to do that to make your case, because you're basically, you're, you're, you're not benefiting by like stifling that process, so a big part of it is, is in those investigations is you're managing like these troves of like documents of, of whatever company it is, especially in these large tech investigations for years and years showing like how a product developed and how it works and trying to distill that from understanding it yourself uh, in a, you know, whatever technology it is or, or industry and distilling that to a regulator who is uh, like significantly underpaid compared to you and is like, <laughs> and managing like a lot larger of a, of a docket. So you're you're sort of trying to translate that, and that is often the biggest challenge. So, what kind of clients do you work for on the antitrust side and on the patent side? I'm just curious. Yeah, um, antitrust. My focus slash interest has generally been um, 
like tech companies. Um, I'd say I've also um, been involved with a few pharmaceutical companies on the more like the reverse payment type of stuff. Um, and then some of my favorite work is actually is another thing you maybe wouldn't learn about as much in law school is like um, often you have antitrust issues or interests that might arise from regulators on companies that are a lot smaller than would otherwise warrant a large investigation. And this is more like regulator reaches out and says, hey, like this small acquisition of, uh, let's say like, I had one that was related to like kosher foods, like not something you would expect to be antitrust scrutiny, right? So one of the best things about it is you have to learn everything about kosher foods in order to make your arguments and your market definition, like uh, sales, like how this market has developed over time and like what how concentrated it is by region, um, anything that might be of interest. Um, so you have to first learn that, and then you're you're trying to explain why or why not this, depending on what side you're on, this market concentration does or doesn't exist. But these are things that wouldn't even arise like in a filing because this is like a pre-filing advisory matter. Um, so I've I've taken on a lot of those when they come up, uh, and I find that to be the most interesting because it's usually you, a more senior partner and then just client, so you get a lot more of the business side of things. Well, it's funny when you say that. Having a mix of matters of size is actually really important. I mean, just all big matters means the amount of responsibility lower level junior attorneys gets gets very thin. And so, on the other hand, having the chance to work on bigger matters also gets you exposed to more sophisticated stuff. It's funny you mentioned kosher foods because it's a weird market because there is an authoritative source that can control you know, all the accreditation, but the other reality is for, for Orthodox Jews who are not allowed, who on weekends are not allowed to use machinery, it's really physical walking distance determined what you can do. And it starts to bring up this idea that, in fact, it, it cuts what's a uniform product market off into very narrow geographic markets. You know, what you'll see, for example, um, a lot of early research was done on the concrete industry. Why? Um, you didn't drive very far with concrete. And so you had these very discreetly well-defined markets. You get your mind around them. And there is a bunch of writing that says kosher foods actually has this weird aspect of this. Because it has to be with, you have to, to have a service, you have to have six people who live within walking distance of a temple or a synagogue. And to do that, it just, you know, you just like draw this line around it and you well, can realize it can stretch. Well, the minion is a whole different issue. And Who's that's... Involved? I don't know. I, I was taught it was the minion, but I'm told it's not exactly right. There's a wire that runs through my, right through the backyards of the people across the street from me that allow, if you're within the area, you're allowed to do things during the Sabbath, even if you're observant, that you're not allowed to do outside that area. And if you ever go down the Kinwood Trail, which is a very popular walking trail down, this is a very typical thing. They take old railroads right of, rights of way, which you don't need as railroads anymore, but there's these long straight paths where they turn them into walking paths. There's a minion that goes right straight, you know, through cutting through one of them, and you watch people go to it and turn around. It's just really interesting to see how that all plays out there. I'm sorry? It is in a room. In a room. Yeah. All right, I'll take a room. I, I, you'll have to ask someone with much more um, knowledge and authority. And Symbolic boundary, typically yeah. using fishing line. Yes. Anyway, just a little fun anyway. fact. Well, it's something you learn, you know, and it's it's yeah. when it, it's interesting in the local grocery store we have an entire section of kosher foods because of these qualities that attracts, not by accident, a, a different population, uh, very uh, people who are observant. So anyway, I'm off on the risk. But all right, um, a question I get a lot from students: if you're going to be, if you're just going to be a tech lawyer, um, you um, you chose to clerk. Good decision, and why did you decide and it work out the way you thought? Yeah. Um... So people have a lot of different reasons for deciding to clerk. Um, I would say not having had a sh the strongest idea, like even just coming out of law school, of exactly what group I was going to be in, um, especially starting at the firm I was at, they kind of said, you know, people split and move around up till third, fourth year. Uh, so that was kind of an open, open-ended thing for me. Um, I found after two years, it was a couple different things. One. COVID notwithstanding, an opportunity to go to kind of like a city I've never lived in before. So I actually didn't look at really anything on the East Coast or even the West Coast. I just kind of wanted to go somewhere I would not otherwise live. So I went to Memphis. Um, and then two, uh, it was very like, it was, it was kind of refreshing to take a step back from big law after having been there for two years and like go to 
it's not quite like nine to five, but like a lot less yes. um, weekly hours and um, a lot more of determining your own schedule. Um, and then the third was kind of just a totally different work and academic environment than I'd had before. So uh, I really liked it. And then on top of all that, the actual like substance of clerking I really liked because uh, the judge I clerked for um, tried to take, uh, basically took on, as uh, Professor Yu and Caroline mentioned, um, like patent, he was in the patent pilot program, which is like more symbolic than anything else, but basically we took a lot of patent cases from the other two districts in Tennessee. So I saw, uh, I had a speedboat patent trial, which was really cool. Um, I had a couple cases that uh, ended on summary judgment for, one was for a gun manufacturer, or gun magazine manufacturer, um, we had uh, medical devices um, for like spinal taps, guitar pedal boards. We saw like a lot of broad range of like technology and, and that partially was just luck that that year happened to have all that. But I'd say like finding a judge and seeing if you are deciding to do it and that is an interest, you can kind of see what sort of cases they've taken because chances are they would continue to at least try to get um, similar subject matters like if they can. So um, I really appreciated that my judge kind of went out of his way to always get as many of those types of cases as possible. And as the patent clerk, I got to, even if they were only technology facing and not patent issues, like I got to handle them. So I think I got lucky, but it worked out. It's hard to go back after being there two years, then leaving for, you just did, it was one year. Right. And then returning as a fourth year. Mm -hmm. You said, was it hard? Yeah, was it hard to sort of get reintegrated? Um, I didn't think so. I I found at least, um, the firm Matt was very receptive to people clerking, so it was pretty common for someone to leave. Often, I know a lot of other people that left for district court plus an appellate and then came back. Um, so I, I didn't find it too bad. I'd say the harder part was coming back and it's still virtual and leaving when it was virtual. That was kind of depressing. Yeah, that's Because uh, I came back and I was like, uh, it helped that I'd already been there and, and, and knew most of the same people that were still there, but I think it could be a lot more challenging if you were going to a new firm where you didn't know anyone, like I, I think this could be a little isolating right now, coming back. Are you guys back in person? Uh, you were in three days a week, or requested three days a week. Is that gonna be the norm, do you know? Or? Yeah, it was, I mean, they, yeah, I'd say compared to other places, they seem to want people more in person. Um, so like, um, uh, my fiance is at Latham, and they're still full She's remote. at Latham, right. Yeah, and they're still full remote, so. It also kind of depends on the office. Like I know our DC office is like seven, seven hundred fifty attorneys now. So, fifty? Yeah, they have this large two buildings, so they kind of just want to use it. I think. <laughs> uh, city center. It's like near Chinatown. Oh, gotcha. It's interesting because a lot of places that are trying to get their people back full time, and you want their, um, they start losing people. You know, people have, employees have pushed back pretty hard. Yeah. So it's, it's watching this balance is kind of interesting. This is something you shared with me when you were, we were chatting. You said half your docket was patent cases. And so it's like, you know, even though that wasn't necessarily half the judge's docket, but because they had to funnel to one clerk and they were half of what you wanted to do, it ended up being a much more uh, tech exp intensive experience than you would expect from a district judge in Western, in Memphis. Yeah. So it's fascinating to me. And it was actually, part of it was also that I uh, got to do a lot of cases that were not just uh, patent or tech. So that was also interesting just because you see how the law interacts with, you know, your more day-to-day. -day. We did a lot of insurance stuff, which that stuff we did not care for, but you see a lot of insurance litigation. Um, I didn't really handle a lot of uh, most of the criminal things, but we had a lot of criminal docket. Um, so seeing, seeing a broad range of cases, especially if you have any interest in future life litigation, I think is, is very helpful. And, and even not, you, like, you're gonna see what goes wrong and what causes so it's interesting. I mean, I would say law schools, I think Penn is pretty apt, typical of what I'm about to say. This is not an indictment of us, but as law schools generally. As you point out, we teach a lot through appellate cases. And we, can, uh, we try to do non-appellate things, particularly in trial simulations. But even that, you don't get to pick a jury because you get volunteers to be in the jury. And a huge amount of it is motion practice, discovery battles, all this pretrial stuff that we don't do. And the other thing we don't really simulate, uh, no law school I know does well, is damages. 
you know, and uh, a lot of what we're doing is that. And I will tell you, the first, the next trial I will I see end to end, will be the first trial I see end to end. How many trials did you see? Did you live through? So the case that I have right now, that is set to go to trial in Delaware in July, I actually started on the positive one, which I think is very. Uh, this is at Covington. Yeah. And so, how many years ago was that? Uh, it was filed in 2018. 2018. So it was basically filed. I started was there for two years. It was actually on a stay pending PTAB. And then I came back and it was on stay. <laughs> so. And it's going to go to, well, it's scheduled to go to trial. Yeah, it's looking very likely, but we'll see. You never know. Because we're in summary judgment motions right now. And how many trials did you see while you were clerking? Clerking, I would say. Three criminal and one full patent trial. Mm -hmm. yeah. Criminal, a lot more. Oh, most of the civil things like settled out. I had two that settled day of first day before first day of trial. So. Very typical. Yeah. So I remember people at, when I was working at Hogan, another big firm in DC. There hadn't been a trial in the entire you know that office in like five plus years. I mean, it's just, they're very rare. So even if you want that experience, it's kind of hard to get that exposure. I always thought one of the great things about clerking is you get to see, you know, parts of the process which law schools don't teach very well. Yeah, yeah, and then you're you're sitting there ruling all those discovery battles that some associate is writing on the other end. So, yeah. So, looking to the future, how are you thinking? What what do you imagine yourself doing down the road? Uh, this is stuff I've been thinking about a lot, and <laughs> I'm not positive. Um, for right now, I feel like. Learning a lot most days, um, and having been back less than a year now, it feels like a good time to be able to, you know, get more exposure to different parts of, of kind of antitrust cases and different businesses. Uh, I can see myself, in, you know, within a couple of years, like if the cool in-house opportunity came up specifically, I don't know, the stuff I'd care the most about would be like space or travel related. Um, that is like. So for yeah, something, something like that, or like you know, electric cars. I, I think if it was something I care a lot about, I can see myself like doing for an in-house gig. But um, to the extent I can continue to manage uh, right now, I think uh, we'll stay put and see where, where it takes you. Can you think? Okay, is there something you wish you had been told while you're a law student that you now know that you've been in practice? Or did we do such a great job preparing you that we taught you everything and there's no gaps? Honestly, one of the most useful classes I took in school, which I ended up in because I, I think I like, signed up for classes late or something, um, was discovery methods. And like first and second year litigation associate is like a lot of that, whether it's Drafting like ROG response or interrogatory and like production responses, figuring out like I, I think someone described to me as like like basically American litigation is like playing uh, poker with all your cards up, right? But discovery allows you to narrow the amount of cards you have to show and expand the other side, right? And that is like a lot of what you do early on. And like, like Professor Yu said, a lot of these cases don't end up getting to trial because they either are, most of the Seattle law firm is probably, is probably not going away on a dismissed stage, but like perhaps at summary judgment or somewhere along the line after discovery, you may settle. And, and that's like a lot of what you're doing early on. Um, and, and sending emails back and forth to opposing counsel different firms have different tones of doing that. Kind of learning more about that instead of just assuming everything is doc review, I think that would have been helpful. Because like in my head it was like, okay, first, second year associate is, is like doc review, but it's really like discovery generally is a lot of it, and that's a lot broader than I think you're, you're exposed to as a, as a student. But if you are going to law firm as a litigation associate, it's probably good to know that that is like a good part of what you is there something looking back you wish you'd done, that you didn't do, or done more of that you did? Yeah, I think 
I would say I probably I did like a lot of I'm trying to think actually. I don't know that there's something I would have done necessarily more of. I didn't take a lot of like bar classes and I was pretty happy with that. Um, uh, I probably would have taken antitrust. <laughs> I probably could have traded out one of those IP seminars for any trust. You did that, Ken. Am I wrong? Well, you uh, did the clinic? No. But you did the... Uh, I did the entrepreneurship clinic and stuff. Right, and then is that the key, key, key up? The angel oh, yeah, yeah. Actually, I forgot about it. That was actually a really good experience. Yeah. Why don't you, you want to talk about that for me yeah. and, and, and pronounce it correctly? Yeah. Um, so there's a... Um, this is kind of what I, was, I touched on earlier, just like doing as much stuff that Penn offers outside of the school. Like, you know, you're in a growing city with like a lot of cool opportunities that go well beyond like just the law school classes. Um, so I worked with, I think that was through Professor Dahl, um, and we had a, there's like an angel investment forum that meets at Chestnut, um, and we got to sit in and assist with the diligence process um, for, for uh, startups like looking for funding. Uh, and that was really cool because you're seeing pitches from anywhere from like you know, a Drexel or Penn student to uh, like a lot a heavily established like Venture. startup, yeah, yeah. Um, often from other countries, and like you get to see a lot of both like cultural differences, style differences, what people are receptive to, what they're not. Small things like I remember one uh, one person that was like a recent grad had a really really good like probably one of the best presentations I'd seen, and like really cool technology, but then she had these like animations on her deck and like someone at the end was like your presentation was incredible but like just take the take the animations off because they're so distracting it's just like small things like that that you learn and then if you're ever in a position one day where maybe that's something you want to do like if you all have had the exposure and then from the legal side you're seeing you're part of the diligence team so if you were to if you were to go do corporate or um, like an m a type practice group at a law firm a lot of what you'll be doing especially as a junior associate will be reviewing X aspect of a deal. And for us, for me at least, I did a lot of the IP due diligence, like looking at the patents, seeing like, trying to evaluate their strength. Um, you might be doing things about like employment or what other risks, like like environmental risks they have. So you get to see kind of like what this company is worth, but then what are the like asterisks on this company. Um, that, was, that was a really cool experience and I did that for you. So to the extent you can get. And it's, it's, how do you pronounce it? The key? Uh, Kiratsu. Kiratsu. Yeah. Yeah. Is that advertised? It's just, it's part of the curricula? curricula that's... How'd you find it? I forget. <laughs> uh, I want to say that came up on a, like one of these like CTSE newsletters. Did you include it in our... Yeah. Uh, what, I'd know, say sometimes, sometimes things just pop up like that and you're like, huh. Like, we worked a lot on the annual report, so yeah. yeah. Yeah, so just get exposure, and then things will sort of like, you know, things will arise because you've exposed yourself to more chances for them to pop up. I think coming here helps, but I would also encourage you to, uh, for those of you who are one L's, talk to two L's and three L's because they've been exactly where you are now. And um, you know, I remember at the end of my first year, I mapped out how I was going to spend my next two years. You know, I was going to do personally. I did moot court, which happened at a certain time, a certain rhythm, and it had implications. So I took this. I found that the externship I wanted to do was best done in the third year, and he started moving stuff around. And, but I had to have a, a, a set of experiences I was looking for, which I was constantly fiddling with. It's never final. But um, the thing you don't want to have happen is that there's an experience you wanted to have, and it was only possible last semester, and you didn't, you, you didn't choose not to do it. You backed into that choice and you know, may have some regrets. And for our LLMs, it's probably not yeah, that's less of an issue, possible, but. right, all the opportunities. The other thing you'd said, you know, one thing that resonates with me is a lot of people are obsessed with bar classes. I mean, I don't, I don't know if you guys know this, but the bar, March, major parts of the bar exam are um, trivia tests uh, because they can only test you on things for which there are multiple choice answers. So in con law, they cannot test you on anything interesting. So taking con law, I mean, is that it's still like, the case? Yes. They can, they'll ask a, a very typical question is if you move from Pennsylvania to Washington, D.C., how long can they, what's the length of, proper length of a waiting period before you can vote? They can, there's an answer to that question, so they can test it.
Um, what is substantial burden under Roe v. Wade? They can't test because uh, nobody knows, and actually this year, by the time they actually do the bar, the answer may be different. Uh, so, I mean, but anything interesting is out. And so, like, you know, to me, evidence was like logic puzzles and all this, you know, and a bunch of stuff you never think. It, it, go to Barbary if, you, if you're an employer that supports that. They will spoon feed you everything you need to know. And it doesn't actually line up with things that are interesting or important as a law student, you know. It's about just, the essay portion? The essay portion is graded by people who are paid like a dime per copy. So their, their goal is to grade them as rapidly as possible. And what they will train you to do is like, they're looking for these 10 magic words. If you gibber, but write those 10 magic words and underline them, you will pass that essay. And they will tell you exactly what to do. And if you, you can start, I mean, I mean you're making, this is the funny, this is the weird thing about um, any of us who've taught. Evaluation instruments are funny things. I mean, they're never perfect, and they're always, and the situation where you've got an 80% pass rate, you're not exactly trying to make, and it's pass fail, you're not trying to make fine graduations about the difference between an 82 and an 83%. It's a very blunt instrument, and it's applied and designed, applied and evaluated in a very blunt way. And this, you know, I see all my students get all hung up over this, and I think hundreds of thousands of people pass, the, graduate every year and all, like, 80, 90 percent of us pass the bar. Well, in California, like Washington, the state of Washington, that's lower. But if you actually, they have one unaccredited ABA law schools, and if you restrict it to first-time takers, there's people who went to unaccredited law schools who take the bar over and over and over again. Once you actually look at first-time takers, particularly from ABA accredited law schools, the numbers are actually not that different from other states. They just look different because they allow, yeah, they allow people to take the bar who frankly, would not be admitted to an ABA credit law school. Kardashian. No, don't even get me started. I'm not. Anyway, but, um, oh my God. all right. Uh, we're at uh, 15 minutes. I could keep doing this forever, but I want to open the floor up to ask for you to ask questions, and you any questions you may have for critique. Please. Uh, you introduce yourself and tell us. Brandon Merrill, 1L student. Um, you said, so you went at Covington two years and went back to clerk. How do you feel like your experience with the work experience impacted your clerkship? And then kind of conversely, how do you feel like not having clerked right away, like from Penn, impacted your like first few years as an associate? Yeah. Um, I, I, know, I know it's still the majority of people like clerk straight from school, but I think I would have had a much harder time like having done that. Um, I just, I think on one hand, you're probably closer to the actual like legal research aspect of it, but I think a lot of the day-to-day -day juggling, so for example, right now I'm, as an associate, I'm on like three or four cases, but as a clerk, especially district court, like I had 50 to 60 at any given point, right? And those are like, you know, you don't know when someone's gonna file a motion, you don't know when like someone will file something for an emergency hearing, you have your schedules, but then those are subject to change, especially like it was a COVID year. So all of that was always in flux. And I think like purely in terms of just like juggling that many things, um, working first helped me a ton, um, both after undergrad and after law school. Um, that being said, my clo clerk um, went straight from uh, straight from law school, and there were times where, I, and I think that was a good balance, just because she uh, often things that were like no longer fresh in my mind in terms of just like actual law, <laughs> like she knew and was like more versed at. So I think I think there's probably merit both ways. My personal preference was I I found it more worthwhile to have worked first because I actually knew I wanted to do it as opposed to something I was just like signing up to do. Now, when do you like apply to clerk like high school? They've actually got they've got it uh, somewhere between your two L and three L okay. years. So sort that's of, not as bad. sort of okay. It leaks like crazy, but they all do. Uh, yeah, I, I guess I it wouldn't it wouldn't have been a decision I would have been able to like decide to do at that time. So I just like felt more confident by the time it actually. Worked. You decided as a three L, correct? No, I didn't apply until like part way through my first, like after having worked. I did quite a bit later. I remember. Yeah, you yeah. Yes, it was right, right. I remember. Yeah. Right. So, the, um, for reference, I think I look. I don't know this year's numbers because I'm not on the clerkship committee this year. 
think a third or so of our graduates who get accepted for clerkships in a given year are alums. And so it's, it's increasingly common to see that happen. And um, uh, there's a bunch of really mundane things about it, which is you'll actually get paid more if you go in after having been admitted to the bar because you're actually hired as a lawyer. Whereas if you clerk straight through, your, you may have passed the bar in July, but you're not formally admitted till November. Oh, in your clerkship, you get paid more. You do. Yeah, it's, oh, it's significant. It's significantly it's more. Great. You don't do the clerkship for the money. Don't get me wrong. Yeah. But, you know, <laughs> although the bonuses you guys get, did you get, a, did you get a bonus coming back? Oh, totally. You, are you allowed to tell what Covington's clerkship bonus is? 50? So I mean that's fifties market. When I was did it was ten. You know I think you know it was you know, it's very different worlds. But I mean it won't you know it, but for the experience you know think about what you gain from it going along with your career. You can never get that experience at any price later in your career. And so I think it's something that you should seriously think about. I think if you're going to be an M and A lawyer though it doesn't make a ton of sense. So there are a lot of corporate lawyers who swear by their clerkships. You know it's it's you know it's an interesting uh, that is very specific. I would encourage you to talk to people in your field and find out what the benefits are, and you know maybe it's something tax court or something else that makes sense for certain kinds of transactional practices. Yeah. I know a lot of people who've done um, a very popular thing for us for our corporate people to do is to clerk for the Delaware Chancery Court, which is the biggest bankruptcy court, and they do corporate restructuring. And that is different. You know, there's people who work for bankruptcy courts. Delaware happens to have the most important bankruptcy courts in the U.S. And so, you know, and it's, it's very, finding the right path for you is a conversation. Uh, but the other thing is, you know, I do think, I did see some people who did clerkships the way you did it. And you um, didn't, it was not as much an issue for you apparently, but it does allow you to re-engage with either shift to a different firm very easily or to re-engage with your own firm uh, on your own terms. Like, you know, I'd like to do more work for this person than that person or reposition yourself. Did you find that? Yeah, I, um, I had, uh, so I, I ended up back on um, the patent case because I was on it, but I came back and said, I basically want to just do antitrust now unless it's damages for patent cases. So that's kind of my wheelhouse now is mostly antitrust and intersection with patent stuff, but not pure patent issues anymore. Um, and I know other people have come back from clerkship and totally shifted practice groups or just actually out of my kind of friend group as from summer associates, it's anecdotal. We had like eight of us and six of us clerked and all six of us came back so for whatever that's worth. But it lets you kind of definitely as Professor Yu says, redefine, especially if you've done even just a year, you might have an idea like, oh, I really don't want to be on these giant antitrust investigations. So like, I'm not coming back if that's what you're putting me on. So it's definitely a good opportunity for you to kind of negotiate your own career. I think if there was a wheelhouse, I would say a year working. And I think that's, if I could go back and have decided a little bit earlier, that's what I would say. Yes. Hi, thanks for taking the time to chat with us. Um, I, yeah, so my name's Jesse Levin, I'm also 1L, and I was just curious, um, you mentioned in like your next phase you consider going in-house. Um, I was just curious why, I guess your thought process in deciding like not wanting to go to like a regulatory body, um, and if you considered that, and I guess what, what um, yeah, if you could just talk about that. Yeah, um, that would actually be the other thing like I would have okay. been interested in, um, especially having like gained a little bit more of an idea. I think because of just like a personal interest in like more being involved, like I guess be between uh, having been at a consulting company and then a law firm, I've never really been like at a product. <laughs> so I think just purely for like having being somewhere where that's mission driven that I could like kind of feel behind whatever the, the company is, that would just be an experience that's like a personal reason that I'd seek out, um, but it'd have to be kind of specific because um, I wouldn't want to just go in-house for the sake of going in-house, if that makes sense. Yeah. yeah. And there's a world I would assume in which you would go to government maybe for a couple of years. Yeah, and that, that's very common too. Um, to an in-house position. Right, um, that's very common like uh, I think right around your fourth to sixth year, you see a lot of people that get really, really cool exit options. I had uh, someone from my summer class who just left um, to be like product counsel at like a tech company. You start to see a lot of cool like jobs open up because you, you don't realize it, but then by the time you're that year, you're like, oh, actually I kind of know a little bit. Like 
on my own. So I don't know when that exactly happens, but uh, yeah, a lot of those opportunities open up. And, that, and a lot of people leave for like FTC, DOJ, especially. It's really interesting. Being product counsel, the technology of the product is at the center in a way, and so you're really bus you're tied into the business. You know, it's as much understanding that business as it is when you're in the lawyers. It's like it's interesting. Those jobs are different, say, being the general counsel's office where you're just doing litigation stuff. This is designing products, crafting them, dealing with privacy. I mean, it's just amazing what how different those jobs are. Not for everybody, but to me, when I was in law school, I didn't even know these jobs existed and what the differences were, and, and that's sort of why we're here. Uh, thank you. My, uh, my name is Kevin Seltzer. I'm on 1L as well. Um, and I was just wondering, so a lot of us 1Ls are, you know, two months or so away from starting our, our first legal jobs. And I was just wondering what you did over the summer is what you found that, that you've been working that was maybe helpful about those experiences that you didn't expect or any advice generally. Yeah. Um, so my 1L summer, I was like a LCLD scholar, which is like a legal counsel for um, but basically it was split between a law firm and um, an energy company in-house. Um, so I'd say the law firm experience was kind of just like a sort of babied version of what you'd get as a 2L, 2L or summer associate. So I would say that was, it was good and it was, you know, I, I enjoyed the experience, but like the in-house part was particularly interesting for some of the reasons I just mentioned. Um, working on like liquefied natural gas and Stuff and kind of interesting seeing what that looks like. I will say one thing you learn quickly is when you're at a law firm, you're like a revenue generator and you're treated as such. When you're in-house, depending on the type of company, as Professor you said, like product counsel at a tech company, I think it's a little different because you're part of the development process. When you're at some of these larger companies, you might be considered just a cost center. So you're like, you might, it's like kind of like this like black hole of like, oh, this is where legal and accounting and like all the things we don't care about are. And this is like the stuff we care about. And it definitely like was a big dichotomy there. Um, that was interesting to see, especially there. Uh, so. yeah. I think the opportunities for many people to have been for what will be a client of a firm and understanding that structure of general counsel's office and it's you know it's overhead. You want to minimize it as much as possible, and what they're how they think, how they live, is a pretty unique experience. You know, it's what I hope. You know, if you, even if you decide to go to a firm someday, it's a really neat experience. And if uh, even like um, you can do this as an externship, you can do it to fulfill your pro bono requirement um, to do the government, the regulatory body that regulates you. Even just being there two days a week for a short amount of time gives you a much better intuitive understanding about it in ways, well, I mean, the nasty little secret about the PTO is that the only correlation, uh, the strongest correlation, okay, you, your patent runs 20 years from the day you apply. And they take different lengths of time to issue. So the faster the issue, the, the longer the effective date of your patent. The best correlation with speed is how well your, um, a patent attorney knows the patent examiner handling your case. And this is not anyone's idea of the rule of law. It's, you know, it's old fashioned, you know, contact networks and all this, but reality. Yeah, and this is because partly the, what they learn how to navigate it, because they're usually ex PTO people themselves, and who they're friends with and who they're, you know, playing golf with or whatever. And it's just, you learn certain things about organizations and what makes them go that you can never learn from the outside. I did. Yeah. And you know, that's a whole, actually, so at one of the breakfasts I never got to this, they asked me, understanding what makes Hill people go is really, really different. Um, so I, I did it because I was interested in policy. And there were people like me around, but basically they're interested in politics. And I saw this vividly because it was the middle of a presidential campaign. The entire staff, personal staff, took a leave of absence. Uh, so, okay. yeah, thank you. <laughs> um, yeah. Um, so. It's one of these things where, um, anyway, but um, that's really what makes them go, you know, is the politics of it. And people like me who are interested in the policy have trouble. I mean, it's, it's not, it was fun for a while, but the long-term su success drivers and what interested me didn't line up well. And the other thing is you have to really care about the issues because the battles are never over. Um, there's always be authorization, but more importantly, appropriations is every single
And so just because the problem has been authorized, if they don't allocate money, there's no program. And so it's just boom, boom, boom. And you have to be a certain kind of person to do that. So we have time for one more question, if there is one. So we'll leave this. Uh, any closing thoughts, Pratik? Um, are most of you all one else then? How many of you are one else? Raise your hand. Okay. Um, how many of you are two L's, three L's, and LLMs? That's our that's our typical. Yeah. Okay. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I would say uh, obviously finals and all that are coming up, but uh, <laughs> after that, like, I would definitely. The, the thing that helped me the most in law school was like finding hobbies and things like even during like the most stressful times, which I carry with me now, like to just like carve out time to go do something because as busy as you are now, next year will be busier and then it really never ends from there. So 